Welcome to Inside the Game right here on One Soccer and the One Soccer digital platforms. And I am Gareth Wheeler. This is episode lucky number seven. And we're really lucky to have a top-notch guest tonight join us for the next hour. Uh, before we get into it, a quick shout out to my wife. I need to say happy anniversary. It's our fourth anniversary today. And I'm saying that because my anniversary gift to her is she gets to enjoy this live stream with the rest of you. I'm basically Lance Romance. So uh, then the NFL draft later on tonight. So a big night in the Wheeler household, but happy anniversary to my wife, Brenna. Now we've had rave reviews about our new sign. In order to be a proper bro program, you need a new sign. Yeah, we, we, uh, we have a massive budget here on One Soccer on these digital platforms as well. But you need to have a sign to be a proper show. So I think we've taken things up a notch here as we enter week number four. Now, if you're joining us for the first time, the concept is simple. We're pulling back the curtain with influencers, players, administrators, coaches to go inside the game. Their stories, their anecdotes, the long road travel to success, and their opinion all wrapped into 60 minutes of informative fun. That's what we'll call it. Uh, we're basically night school for soccer. So we hope that you sit back, enjoy, and learn something along the way. So we're thrilled to have you on board tonight. Just very quickly, if you have a question for tonight's guest, uh, fire away. Just put it in the YouTube chat. I believe it's on this side right here. Or you can hit me up on Twitter at Gareth Wheeler. And a quick reminder about our One Soccer Isolation coverage. Monday through Friday, it's the Hangout at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 a.m. Pacific. And then Happy Hour with a focus on the women's game. That goes Wednesday evenings at 5 p.m., 2 p.m. Pacific, where basically you dra grab a drink and you have whatever you want and you to have a toast with the ladies. It's a ton of fun. Janine Becky was excellent on yesterday's show. And to rewatch any of our shows, subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, we're One Soccer, and you can watch away any of the shows that you may have missed live. Now, let's get to tonight's guest. Just outstanding. And I believe once upon a time, he coached Janine Becky's brother, Drew, but he's coached a lot of players uh, over his travels coast to coast to coast. Uh, and of course, over his travels, He's become a true Canadian soccer success story, one of perseverance, one of determination, uh, ambition, the willingness to take chances, and then taking full advantage of the opportunity when it presents itself. It's no exaggeration in saying that this man has gone the extra mile and then some in his pursuit to manage at the highest level, from Montreal to Portugal to our nation's capital to the capital of Brazil. Kansas City, San Fran, LA, all before he headed due north to the Pacific Northwest, headed back north of the border to the great city of Vancouver, where he's now currently stuck two games into his second season with the Whitecaps. And by the way, coming off a marquee victory, we shouldn't forget about that, over the Los Angeles Galaxy the last time out. Although he's well-traveled, it only tells part of the story. Every stop, he's become a better coach while winning silverware along the way. You name it, CSL, USL, NASL, youth football in Brazil. His collections of honors is impressive, it's vast, and it's a statement of what kind of coach this man is. A team builder, he's a squad builder, an elite trainer, and a true student of the game. And like I said, a Canadian success story through and through, breaking down the barriers to become one of the most well-regarded coaches in all of North America. He'll write a book about it someday, I'm absolutely sure. And perhaps tonight will give us a sneak peek into the past and maybe show us what the future may be in store as he continues to pen his next chapter. It's a pleasure to welcome the head coach of the Vancouver Whitecaps, Mark DeSantos, inside the game. Mark, how are you doing tonight? Thanks for joining us. I'm good, thanks for having me. It's, uh, I feel uh, very blessed with your, your presentation, but hopefully I'm gonna, be able to to open up and share as much as I can be uh, behind every city that you named. There's a, an incredible story. So hopefully we'll be able to go through that today. We have an hour so we can dig pretty deep into that, but sometimes an hour is not enough. So we'll get to as much as we can tonight. Uh, first and foremost, how's your family doing during this very difficult period of time, Mark? Family's good. They were in Montreal for, for a couple of weeks before everything started. They, they got stuck there a little bit and now they're with me here in Vancouver. Um, it's just a weird situation, right? In the morning, 
I'm in my office and, and I work, I answer emails, I watch at least a game a day. Uh, and then uh, I, I try to choose clips of that game that relate to what we want to be about as a team. Mary is the teacher, so she does the homeschooling. In the afternoon, I do things with the kids, dinner comes, and then we repeat again. You know, <laughs> so much we could do right now. I think it's very similar to, to everyone. And we have to be very patient and try to learn uh, with this situation and try to grow in another area of our life. Now, you say you're watching games. Are you just watching your games? You're watching other teams and other leagues? Like, what are you watching, Mark? To be, to be honest, we, we already overanalyzed the Sporting Kansas City game and we overanalyzed the LA Galaxy game and there's no next game to prepare. So right now, we were all ready to play Colorado and had, had the game prepared, but now we don't know what our next opponent is and our last game is done. And uh, so I have four or five clubs that I relate with, four or five clubs in the world that I think what they do in certain moments of the game relate to what we want to be about in, in the Whitecaps. So I downloaded a lot of their, of their games and I, I re-watch them and choose clips from, uh, from their, their games. Very interesting. Uh, you know, the work doesn't stop. Uh, do you get to play at all? I, I know that you play guitar. Maybe you get on Zoom. You and Nick Dasovich could jam because he used to be a rock star back in the day. Nick is more of a rock star than I am. I, I do. It's a hobby to play guitar. I'm learning. Well, I always liked cooking, but now I'm trying to be a, more of a chef Cousteau, a level of cooking, you know? So I'm learning, but my wife, it's her big moment home, so she doesn't want me to help all the time. <laughs> I, you know, for I was speaking with someone about that. Uh, the 2016, 17, and 18 were in, in half of the season in, in, in Vancouver of last year. So for the last three, three years and a half, I, I spent maybe in a total of 40 months 10 months with my family. Wow. Yeah. That's so there was a lot of sacrifice there. And now this moment, I, I do things with my kids every day. So I, I get to play a lot with them. Uh, so everything they ask me, I say yes. And uh, uh, that's been a good moment to catch up. The family and the sacrifice is going to be a recurring theme here uh, over this conversation. Uh, before yeah. we kind of move on yeah. to all of that, you have the youngest team in all of Major League Soccer entering the season. This is a difficult situation for people of all ages, but especially young players. How are they handling and coping what's been thrown their way? Uh, look, I think our club has been fantastic. I think maybe one of the best ones in the league. And uh, now they're assisting uh, the players in this moment, uh, bringing them food every day. Um, they, they bring material for them to train. We had a bike sent to every player's apartment and house uh, for them to do the programs and gym material. And we tried to assist with programs on uh, mental toughness and imagery and video sessions. Uh, we tried to, to catch up as much as we can with them through, through Zoom. Uh, but the reality is that for the players that we have a young team, like you said, like Ranko's 21, Leonardo Uso is 22, Ryan Raposo that just got drafted is a young player. And for these players to come from their cities, countries, and being excited with the day-to-day -day of the club, being in a preseason where every day they're around people and suddenly after two games they're alone and they have to stay in their apartment and, and they've been very responsible with that, that's not easy. And we have to follow up a lot on that. And we, hope, we just hope this is going to end soon, to be honest. Absolutely. Here, here. Good news that everyone's doing well, despite the uh, absolute curveball that's being thrown um, your and the team's way. Um, let's spin the clock back to when Mark DeSanto started on this incredible coaching journey. And it probably even started before you started coaching when you're growing up as a young boy in Montreal. You lived in Montreal, in the Montreal area up until the age of nine. Your father used to play as well. 
what do you remember about that time of your life? Was that when you fell in love with the game or was it, did it happen after you moved to Portugal? No, it happened in Canada. Uh, I, in the, the 70s, the 80s, uh, there was some semi-pro leagues in the area of Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, and they were very based on uh, the ethnic. You had the Portuguese club, you had the Croatian club, the Greek club, the Italian club. And my father was the coach of Luso Star. It was the Portuguese semi-pro team. Uh, at that time, and I followed a lot of the training sessions, going to games, and I, I think that slowly that what that's the moment where I start getting in love with the game. Then when my father left Canada and we left Canada to go to Portugal because of business reasons, and my father got a really good job there. Um, one Sunday, he brought me to to a game in Porto. Uh, it was Porto Boa Vista a big game and it was full and that's where uh, the stadium was packed, great game. And that, that, that's where I think things started to grow on, on me developing a dream to, to achieve the pro level one day. Uh, and coaching was from an early age, something that I wanted to do. And it was, I think, based from looking at my dad managing uh, that semi-pro team back then. So I would say that the dream of becoming a, a high-level player was never higher than becoming a high-level coach. So it, it, it's, it's funny that you mentioned like the, the, the ethnic communities in every major city because it still holds true, right? Like a lot of players that come through. I mean, me growing up, I think I played for a, a Polish club, an Italian club, um, a Portuguese club. You know, it, it's, it's just remarkable about how those communities are really the lifeblood of a lot of soccer, you know, development in this country from coast to coast. Yeah, and I, but I think in the, the the 70s, the 80s, it was even bigger than it was today. Yep. I remember the Luso Star team that my, my father coach was 70% Portuguese players and uh, the Italian team was 70% Italian players. And it was very, it was very cultural when, when Luso Star would play Corfinium uh, the St. Leonard team in Montreal. And it was almost an Italy-Portugal game, and even in the stands. Uh, and I really remember that the Asian team was pretty much all Asians, you know, and it was culturally, it was great. Uh, and I think that's the when I started to develop the passion really for the game. It's so, no doubt it came through my dad. Absolutely. So you go to Portugal, I mean... It's although at a at a at a local level or community level, football is a big deal in Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, London, go go across this country. Portugal is completely different. And you started off as a player, yet you pivoted relatively early. You, you were playing what third division in Portugal at the time, but you decided relatively early that playing was one thing, but you wanted to be a coach. How did that come about, Mark? Uh, it was a lot about uh, reading uh, biographies of coaches and looking at. Uh, some of the coaches in, in uh, the Portuguese league. And what I think the determined factor was um, I was playing for the, the, U, the, the, the team of my high school. So I was playing in a club. I was playing a youth club for a club called Nazaré in the, the, the city of Aveiro in Portugal. But I was also playing for my school and uh, the, the coach the, the coach of the school, for some reason, he had to step out and in emergency level, I had to stop playing for the school to coach the team at, yeah. 16, at 16 years old. And in all the high school tournament of all high schools of Portugal, we finished third. And I really liked the, the dealing and trying to manage a group and putting a shape on the field and being the leader of that. So I think, I think at 16 years old, that's when it, it, it marked me that I want to coach more than I want to play. For, there's a lot of stories of people that want to play more than they want to coach and coaching becomes an option because they can't play. Me, I have to say it was the opposite. I wanted to coach more than I wanted to play. 
Now, it, it's always been that much more challenging for players if you don't play at the highest level to go on and become a, a head coach or a manager at the highest level as well. But perhaps Portugal at that time was a little bit more open to giving different types of players a chance. Like I'm thinking the 2004 Champions League run, the Jose Mourinho and FC Porto. I mean, that has to be inspirational for someone that, you know, they played, they understand the game, but the opportunity that Mourinho was given and the type of coach he became, like, was he like an inspiration for you at that time? Uh, a big one. I remember doing an internship at the Boa Vista in Portugal when maybe in 2003, I or 2000, yeah, 2003, my first internship was, was at Boa Vista. I had a big interaction with their fitness coach called Ricardo Silva. He introduced me to a professor that changed my life from the University of Porto, changed my idea and my concept of methodology and coaching called Vitor Frad. And from there, the big reference at that moment, not only in Portugal, but in Europe, because now we're, we're in 2020 and what Mourinho did doesn't count as much for many. But in 2003 and 2004, what he did with FC Porto and the way he changed training and methodology and then going to Chelsea and having an impact, uh, uh, someone that had a very low and very small or insignificant career as a player uh, it was an inspiration, not only for me that I didn't have a, a story as a player, but for even a lot of young coaches in Europe that came from a physical education background. And, and I mean, that Porto team, they had plenty of very good players, Carvalho and Manish and Deco and Ferrer. Like, it was a really good team, but what he was able to accomplish 3-0 in the Champions League final over Monaco, I mean, that's that's next level stuff. And you could kind of feel it at that time, something special was happening in Portuguese football. And that's when you were still there. And you ended up spending a little bit of time at FC Porto, correct? Yeah, I did two internships at Porto, uh, one in 2006 and another one in 2009. Um, and learning from different coaches in the, the, the club and from the spending a lot of time with Jose Guilherme Oliveira and Vitor Frat, that was important. But I think... One of the special things that Mourinho did uh, in 2004 is uh, that the, the team that started the Champions League final and the year after winning Europa League uh, was, if I remember, Vitor Bahia, Paul Ferreira, Ricardo Carvalho, Jorge Costa, Nuno Valente, Manish Costinha, Deco. At least eight of those guys were Portuguese. And today, at the level of Champions League, you see teams winning Champions League and they, they call themselves an English team or a Spanish team where 20% are Spanish or English. <laughs> and, and the Mourinho of 2004, it was real Portuguese team with uh, Benny McCarty, a dead lay, so a South African, a, a Brazilian, but the majority were all Portuguese. And that's very hard to do in today's soccer. So if you see a team leaving Man City, if they would end up winning Champions League, how many English in that team that are in winning Champions League? So I think it's that was remarkable doing it with so many players from that country too. Did, did that stick with you? Because even today, I believe you have 14 Canadian players in your team right now. And it seems like over the course of your travels, you always always have a group of Canadian players who are in your team or, or is it just circumstance? No, sometimes in interviews, I seem I could be negative if I comment something that's done. Like I remember a, an interview I gave where I commented about the CPL uh, and we could get to that eventually. Uh, but the reality is that my, my objective for help to help Canadians and to promote the Canadian game, I prefer doing it by my actions, improve it by actions, because a lot of people in this game talk, but when it's time to, to act, they're scared of doing it. And I remember in Ottawa, I had a lot of Canadian players in Ottawa, Mason Trafford, uh, 
from there that that played a lot for us and then we go back Sacchio to and Hallworth you, yeah you, a bunch of you guys Carl, uh, Mauro that started and had a great season for us then in San Francisco the same you know Maxim uh, Nana Carl uh, all guys that I, I tried to help swap Mark Anthony Gonzalez that had his best season I think with, with Soul Park Rangers or Tyler Pasher, uh, Amir Didic. Uh, but I want to do it with guys that deserve and not all these players I named at that moment, they deserve to play. And that, that what Mourinho did in 2004 was, was of course an inspiration, but it never was my objective with Canadians. My objective is helping the ones that deserve Let's say if Lucas plays Cavallini or Max Cripple or, or Toss Ricketts, it's because Russell Tiber, they deserve to play. And I, I want to just challenge the Canadian players to get to a, a level that they do things because of what they deserve and not because we feel bad for Canadian players. Well said. No, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, Let's get into those Canadian clubs and the Canadian players that you coached. You decided to move back over from Portugal and and uh, and come back home to Canada. Why did you make that decision? Why didn't you stay in Europe at that time? I actually, I uh, was in Mozambique, uh, in Africa, with my father. My father had a, a, a construction company there, and I was I did some work for the FIFA Gold Project in Mozambique that helped the third world countries to develop the, the sport there. And at the same time, I was uh, working with my dad and working with the FIFA Gold Project. And uh, then I had the opportunity to come to Canada and start working in uh, soccer regions. Uh, that's when I became the technical director of uh, the soccer club of St. Leonard. And then eventually I was assistant uh, to the technical director of the like St. Louis soccer region, that is one of the biggest ones in Quebec. And that's how it started. I wanted to become a coach. I wanted to take my, my badges, my UEFA coaching license. And uh, Canada would give me the opportunity to coach youth and make money to pay the badges. And that's why I came back to Canada. And that's what I did for for years. I didn't buy a car. I, I, I talked <laughs> beginning of sacrifices I took the bus snowstorm waiting for the bus and all the money for me was to travel to to spend time in Porto to spend time I went to Chelsea to spend some time then doing my UEFA coaching license and the money I would do by being a technical director or soccer programs would pay my licenses and uh, that's where the the real sacrifice start uh, some of my friends going to places restaurants driving buying car and they would make fun of me sometimes hey mark you're still taking the bus and i said hey one day i'll drive a real car you know <laughs> and that's how it started and and that's what the beginning of sacrifices were and and the sacrifices paid off and, and things started to happen re relatively quickly trois rivieres uh, in the CSL, you won the Canada or Open Canada Cup. That led to the Montreal Impact job where you came on as an assistant. You were then given the head coaching job of a team that was going into the CONCACAF Champions League, featured in a group with Atlante, with Olympia, like big so, uh, uh, Central American CONCACAF clubs. And you managed your way into that group. A 5 4 aggregate lost to Santos Laguna, a very good Mexican team as well. Things started to tick over nicely. And this was a USL. Montreal Impact squad. And of course, it ended up winning USL Division One at the time with some very special names. But what made that group so good? And how did you acclimate so quickly into that kind of role? I, I have to think Nick DeSantis, that was the, the first person to give me a real opportunity. And I, I got the opportunity from Nick that offered me the, the job of Trois Rivières to coach the reserve team of the Montreal Impact. And at the same time, I served as an analyst to John Limniadis. So John's assistant was Andrea Di Pietro Antonio. And I served as kind of an analyst of scouting opponent for the first team while working with the reserve team. 
and uh, with John, I, I, I learned, you know, and John, it was a period with, for me, being assistant of John, going through everything we went in Champions League uh, was a big learning process for me. And uh, with John Limniadis, I was able to, to get a lot of baggage at a young age because I wasn't only an assistant, I was able to do the head coaching job of the reserve team. Right. And all of that at the same time, was kind of a, a microwave type of coaching course, forced one, right? And I remember when the club decided to, to move and give me the intern job, this is, I think, where, where young coaches need to, young coaches, and I, I want this message to be to the young Canadian coaches because a lot of young Canadian coaches or a lot of young coaches, they wait for the perfect job and they wait for the job that, oh, I, I want, I'm not gonna move from where I am because it's comfortable. And that job, they didn't offer me enough money or they didn't offer me enough security. Your first opportunity won't be secure. Forget that, you, you have, young coaches have to stop living in La La Land, you know? The first opportunity will be uncomfortable, it sucks. It might not be a lot of money. Are you willing to pay that price? And I wasn't, I remember, I didn't know if I was ready to coach the impact. I was young. I was very arrogant. I was sure of myself. And, you know, I was stupid to some extent, but you, there's, when I started with the impact, I was 30, now I'm 42. So you learn with the process. But I, I remember not, I wasn't sure if I was ready. But at that moment, when Nick asked me, I said, yeah, I'm ready. I want this opportunity. I didn't ask about money. I didn't ask. I think I was still on my salary of the Trois-Rivières team. I never spoke about money, never spoke about contract. I just wanted to grasp the opportunity. And I just think what players felt was a lot of passion. I would prepare every game like if it was the final of the World Cup. I... It was for me, it was my last opportunity, my first and last one, because when you don't have a big playing career and you're giving a shot, if it works, it works very well. If it doesn't work, then I became the, I would have become the eternal assistant, maybe the eternal interim coach, never get another job. And yeah, he didn't play at a high level. He, 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 he failed in his opportunity. So I give everything that I had. And I think that maybe the players felt it. The players felt it, the group felt it. And then we went into a run, I think in the USL of 14 unbeaten games. And then that playoff run where we win home against Charlton. In Charleston, we beat Charleston away. We beat Puerto Rico away, we win home. We win in Vancouver. We win the final home. It was six playoffs win in a, a row. And then, of course, you need a little bit of luck factor. In Puerto Rico, I always say it was, there's a, a shot that maybe determined the rest of my career. Uh, when it was 1-0 for us, Puerto Rico has a shot, Fabrice Noel, uh, that hits the crossbar. And if it goes in, and Puerto Rico was good that year. It was the team that went to the semifinal of Champions League and lost in penalty shots against Cruz Azul. And that, that shot hit the crossbar. And a minute later, Peter Bayer scores the 2-0 for us. And then we put ourselves in. If that shot goes in, the, the stadium was full. I don't know. It would leave the stadium, the team. Maybe we would have been knocked out and I would have... Not because I remember the impact only signed me after we won the USL championship. So maybe I would have still be an intern. I don't know. So <laughs> you, need things. you need to embrace your opportunities and you need to have that mother luck next to you in certain moments. Well, th that team, um, it wasn't just you as a fiery coach, Mark, because you could also, as a young coach, lean on a bunch of leaders as well. Like, look at the people that are still in the game today at high levels. Matt I Jordan, will. Houston Dynamo, VPGM, Raz LaDuke, Moro Biello. Like, th that group was something special, and they're still contributing today. And really, that group 
laid the table for what was to become the Montreal impact of Major League Soccer. Yeah, I, you said it so well. The, the, the team that started the, the, the final against Vancouver, Matt Jordan, uh, Adam Brass, Nevio Pizzolito, Cedric Jacquevier, Steve Guru, Testo, uh, Jurston, Donatelli, Le Duc played that game, Mauro came in, uh, Roberto Brown, huge leader, Rocco Placentino, today's a technical director in Montreal, uh, Eddie Sebrango, that's working with the Impact Academy. You didn't need to raw, raw too much. The, the, the leadership was great, and uh, I was lucky to, to coach that, that type of group. Uh, we're about halfway in, and I know I want to spend some time here. Your decision to take your very young family at that time to Brazil to um, in increase your footballing education, to expand your horizons. You did not go with the impact to Major League Soccer. Instead, you went to Brazil. And everything that I've read, it was an absolute trip. You and this young family get on a plane to Sao Paulo. What was that like, Mark, at that time? And what went into that decision? And what was your initial reaction when you landed in Brazil? First, we didn't have a, a, a visa, a work visa, right? So the process of the work, work visa was done while we were there. Uh, so I had the period that I had to wait before starting the work. Um, but I saw the power of, of, of big clubs in Brazil. Uh, I remember when we arrived, the airport was absolutely packed that day for some reason. And there's these two guys with the, the, the jacket of Palmeiras. Palmeiras is, is huge. It's a level of club. When you talk Palmeiras, you talk Boca Junior, the River Plate, Corinthians, Flamingo. It's, it's a big club in South America. And you arrive, you see these two guys grabbing your stuff, your family. You're going in a van to your apartment. They give you the, the keys of your apartment. And you say, wow. I'm coaching youth here. I'm coaching youth. I'm not coaching the first team. So already there, I felt this is serious. But I'll tell you one thing. The experience in Brazil was understanding what soccer means to a nation. And you, I can't compare it. Some people ask me, it's like Canada in hockey. No, it's not even close. It's not even like foot, what football, what soccer is to Portugal or, or England or Italy. Brazil is the next level. Brazil is, the actually banks, they close early, earlier when the national team plays. Things stop. The passion, everybody talks about the game. Everybody knows the players. So I was seen as the Portuguese Canadian guy, but that coached in Canada, that was going to teach the young players how to play soccer. They probably didn't like that too much, did oh, they? Oh, no, I, it was, today I could say it clearly. Sometimes I, fade, I felt like racial things, unfair. Uh, and also felt a lot, a little bit of bullying to some extent. You know, I remember an article in a newspaper that had a donkey and I didn't, I hadn't coached one game, so not even one opportunity. And there was a donkey that wrote and it was writing in a board one plus one equals three. And the title was uh, Palmeira Sires, a Canadian coach to coach in their academy. And you read that and you say, I didn't even have one training session or one game. So, and, and this is happening at the youth level. So, or, or I say that to a lot of youth coaches, we're very comfortable in North America in the youth game. And maybe, maybe this is me being hard. Maybe that's one of our problems. Is that simply there isn't enough adversity? Is that, is that what you're getting at? Like, yeah, you can't, because you can't compare a kid of 15 years old that plays for Palmeiras and a kid of 15 years old that plays for any club in, in, in North America, any youth club. You can't even compare the level of pressure. It's, it's night and day. It's, you can't compare it. And, and you must have been, for all those reasons, you must have been feeling it as well. I mean, I, I read stories about horses on the field, about the difference between some of those big clubs and smaller clubs in Brazil. I mean, 
it, it, it must have been difficult to navigate originally in order to kind of prove yourself when you're even facing adversity when you're on the ground level there. Yeah, look, I, 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 I rem with, with Palmeiras, I think in 50 games, I think we lost three games. Wow. And we, I was under pressure a lot of time. The people have to understand the concept here. I'm coaching the U16 team. I'm not coaching the first, it's the U16 team. And I felt there was chances of me getting sacked two, three times at the youth level. And then we go into the final 20. We end up winning the Brazilian championship in penalty shots in the final against Vasco da Gama. And it's the first time I cried winning a trophy. I didn't cry when we won USL. I didn't cry in ASL. I didn't cry arriving at the final with Swo. None of that. I, emotionally, I'm controlled. Palmeiras, I cried. It's the, the moment where I, I feel I cracked because of so much pressure all the time. And I look, I, there's a story of a Portuguese coach now that is Jorge Jesus at Flamengo. And for him to have the confidence of the media and everybody from Brazil, he had to do results with Flamengo that are unique today. And now he won Libertadores and now he's very accepted in the country, but he had to be incredible to be accepted. It's hard for a, a foreign coach in a country that say that they won five times the World Cup. They kind of reinvented the game. So why would they need help? So that's a little bit the view of many people over there, unfortunately. When you were there, I mean, could you pinpoint top talent when you played it? I know that you managed against Marquinhos. I'm not sure what other players that, that, that our viewers may be aware of. Gabriel Jesus was a U14 player in, in Palmeiras. Did you know it right away? Like, do you know it at that age? How good they are? He was the best one at that level, yes. He was the best one. But can you see that he would become at 14 starter for Brazil and play for Man City? No, it's very hard. Uh, some you see, but Mar Marquinhos, when we played the Copa São Paulo, for me, was the best player in the Copa São Paulo. I remember him small with braces, shaved dead, very skinny. And I remember the first time I saw him, I said I saw him with the number four, the captain of the Corinthians. And I thought to myself, he can't be a center back, like in my head. But then when the game started, I was impressed. The guy was an animal, fast, good in the air, very good defensively. Uh, and other players, my, my goalkeeper, though, at Palmeiras that made us win the Brazilian championship, Daniel Vincent, I saw it right away. This guy's going to play Champions League. Uh, today is one of the goalkeepers of Rome in Italy. But he was very different than everybody. A huge leader, good with his feet, uh, very special already at his age. Uh, you mentioned it earlier before, before we get back to North America. Um, how did your family react to the move? Because you have young kids, you have three kids, your wife, like you said, I mean, she's a true hero in this story that you're writing, writing because obviously, you know, your coaching um, almost takes precedent over a lot of other things that are happening in your life. I, yeah, I'm aware of that. And I feel it's, um, it's a little bit unfair, right? But it's a part of my life that I have to manage and try to be the best I can. But of course, that when you coach at that level, it, it, it looks selfish because your family has to be ready for, for some sacrifices. Mary was very excited about going to Brazil to the point that it was so new. Sao Paulo is a fantastic city, great weather. Uh, we went there two years or three years before the World Cup, right? So all the buzz and build going towards the World Cup was fantastic. Uh, to the point that when I decided that it was better for us to go to, back to North America, that was a hard blow on my wife, especially not on my kids because they were so small. That sure. my wife, but I think John Pugh convinced me. John Pugh convinced me it was a good time to go to Ottawa to build the NASL team from scratch. And I wanted to give more security to my family 
um, because Brazil is very insecure and it's Brazil is the record on firing coaches, right? The, sure. the a coach spends one month in a club and it's a lot. So uh, I wanted to give that security to my family. You, you're, you're right. You built that Ottawa team from scratch. You won an NASL fall championship. But is there any part of you that in the back of your head saying, what could have happened if I stayed in Brazil? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I think about that. I, I think I, I would have reached the first division. I'm sure I would, and I, my my name was getting good in the youth level. Uh, like I, I know I would have been able to be in U20 coach of big clubs, uh, but uh, sometimes I think about it, yes. Look, I'll tell you this, if I didn't have family, I would still probably be in Brazil. Incredible. I, want, I, I can't think only about myself and you always have to see the full package of everything. They, they, they followed you to Ottawa, Swope Park, San Francisco, along the way. Success followed you. You mentioned that you get to build things from scratch. This is a recurring theme of your career, right? Like you build these teams from scratch. You, you put them together. You try to develop them. And it's inevitably turned out successful at all those three stops. What did you learn through those periods of time from Ottawa to Kansas City to, to San Francisco with the Deltas? I learned that nothing is copy paste. You, I don't have an Excel sheet with ingredients and I say copy paste and it works. Dynamics are different, owners are different, players are different, and you have to learn how to adapt. And the thing is, look, in Ottawa, we played in a 4 2 3 1. In Soap, we played a 4 3 3. Then in Montreal, we played in a 4 4 2 diamond. San Francisco, we played in a 3 5 2. Now in Vancouver, we're playing in a 4 4 2. So it's not only a copy paste of a formula or a methodology, it's really the ability to adapt to, to culture, to different clubs, to players, that, that, that's very important in a coach. And then always believe that the next phase is the most important one. So I try to forget very fast. I, I look at the rings and look at the medals but I try to forget very fast that and try to think. I, I, right now, I said that in an interview, I'm obsessed to win something with Vancouver. And rightfully so. I mean, I, I, when I think of you, I think of that steely determination, your fiery demeanor, your emotional. I, I, on the Vancouver Whitecaps Twitter account, it showed your pre-game uh, pre and, and post-match speech against the Galaxy. That's what actually, like, when I think of you, that's exactly what I envision. And it, it rings true. And that's why over the course of your stops, people relate to you and people loved you and people still um, hold you in such high regard in our nation's capital as well. Of course, the Ottawa Fury folded for a quick period of time and now they're coming back in. Aaron's asking a question. Are, are, you, are, are you happy that football's back, coming back to the nation's capital? And what do you make of Atletico Madrid um, being part of that new club in the Canadian Premier League? Uh, look, Atletico Madrid is a big club. Uh, and it's a, a club that has a lot of history and a lot to give. Uh, so I don't want to focus on Atletico Madrid. I want to focus on Ottawa. My time in Ottawa, I saw in the big moments what soccer could be in Ottawa. I, the home opener against uh, New York Cosmos in 2014, the, the semifinal against the Minnesota United, the semifinal of the NASL overtime game, 2-1, incredible game, the fans going on the field, the stands pretty much full. What an environment. And I stay in my head what soccer could be like in the big moments in Ottawa. And I, what I'm happy with uh, Atletico in, in, in Ottawa is that that city deserves a professional soccer team. That's what I'm happy for. Yeah, and, and I mean, there, I don't know if there's many other people that are – um, better to speak about this than anyone else. Like the markets are there. The fans are there in these individual cities. Even me covering the game, I've always found it confusing with so many different leagues being played at the same time, different competitions, MLS, NASL, USL. There's different leagues all over the place. What's your experience through that? And, and although it gave these cities a home, a place to play, do you think it would be easier for for supporters, for fans widespread to follow if things were much more structured in a pyramid? To be, to be honest with you, incredible experiences with all of them. I, I could 
write books from time with the CSL in the USL, the NASL, but I think it's too much all over the place. And I agree with you. I think it would have been easier for uh, North America or the US or Canada to have a structure that it's linear and people could follow. Um, I think it breaks. I think it becomes too individual. Oh, I have my league. It reminds me of the kid that um, you you played with that kid that when the game was so good, he left with the ball because you followed you followed them, you know, and having all these leagues, it's I have my league, oh, but we have a better league. And I, I hope one day it's gonna end. I don't think it's gonna be soon, but I just think we need to find a solution where everything is one place and one format. And of course, you're talking with a guy that believes in promotion and relegation. Yeah, well, well so do I. And I just want, like for me, for Canadian fans, this the Canadian Premier League is easy to understand, right? It's, it's a Canadian league. When you're Ottawa or Edmonton in the past in clubs like this, and you're playing in, in leagues against some obscure cities, for me, it's a challenge for those supporters to follow. That's why this Canadian Premier League has always made sense to me because it's clearly identifiable. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's something very important for Canada and uh, what I hope, what I hope, and you're talking with someone that saw a lot of leagues grow and disappear. Uh, I saw it with the NASL, I saw it with the CSL. I just hope that this, the CPL is sustainable. It's a league that it's going to stay forever and for years and it's going to grow. And that's what I want to see with the CPL. Um, after the Deltas, that franchise folded after you won a championship with a number of great Canadians on that team as well. Adekora, Tissot, Carl Lumet, and Kyle Becker. Um, more MLS experience, of course, with the LAFC. I mean, you're in Kansas City, Peter Vermees, great coach. Bob Bradley, great coach. LAFC expansion year, the stadium, the experience. Will Farrell chatting in your ear was, did, did, did he try to keep you in LA and, 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 and keep you from going to Vancouver, Mr. Will Farrell? No, no. <laughs> we had a, a, a dinner with all the players and the owners and he was there. That was my first time I, I met him and it was in Beverly Hills. I met him and, uh, and his wife and it was a, a great experience. But for me, the, the experience of meeting Will Ferrell was more because of my daughter. Every Christmas we watch Elf and uh, it was just the experience to take a picture with Elf, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my experience with with LA was very different than Kansas City. Kansas City, I was the reserve team coach. Mm -hmm. And uh, LAFC, I was every day with Bob taking part of the decisions of the of the team. And uh, I loved, I said it this and many times, I loved everything about LA, everything about LAFC, everything about the club, the training, the the game experience, Bob, the friendship we we developed, everything, nothing bad to say from there. I, I know at that time, I kept on hearing your name mentioned when it came to head coaching jobs. How did Vancouver come about? And was it a no-brainer once it was offered? There was other teams mm. showing interest in that moment. Uh, but when I first met with Vancouver, my connection with the country uh, my wife telling me because my wife didn't, my family didn't move with me uh, to LA, Kansas, in, Del in San Francisco. So we were doing everything by distance and they came in the March break. I went in the winter. So when my wife told me also, if, if Vancouver is the place, we're going to get back and move again together. And I looked at the, the, what Greg Kerford, Jeff Mallet, the owners wanted to do the long-term vision, how they wanted to rebuild the team, the things they wanted to put in place. I knew it would be a, a, a painful process in the beginning, but I believed in it. And then the city had an impact because I, I'm very confident on saying that I live in the best city in North America today. It's um, easy for me to say it. And I, it's coming from a guy that traveled. Trust me, it's, for me, I live in the best place in North America. I don't think you're, you're going to have too many people argue with, with that statement right there. 
although you mentioned it, um, you knew that it was going to be difficult over the short term changes, both on and off the field going on with the club simultaneously. How did you deal with that? Because you mentioned the pressures of being a head coach. It's, it's an old mantra. You're hired to be fired. Right. And you must've been quite convinced that you were going to be given the opportunity to see this process through. Yeah. So first of all, the, the, the fans, or people that could get frustrated with the process, they, they don't fire you. So <laughs> you could manage that by, I don't have Twitter, I don't have Facebook, I don't read media. I focus on my locker room and the games. And then I know the conversation I had with ownership and the vision of owners and how they wanted to build it. Uh, so I tried and I did my best all the time to stay focused on that. But now with that comes, I know how important it is year two and I know how important it is year three. But the, 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 the changes we've made and the direction we're going in, the youth of the team and the dynamics and what we want to do uh, with the team, the vision between me and Axel, this club is going in the right direction. Axel comes in. I think every club at some point needs to refresh, needs to analyze, needs to progress in a way. Can, can you compare where you are now from where you were as a club a year ago? Huge growth, huge growth. And uh, too bad that people cannot see everything yet, uh, but the growth is huge. Uh, what we're doing with the scouting department, uh, what we're doing in the recruitment phase on dealing with players, clubs, um, making the club grow and the things that I cannot speak about today because it's still backstage, but I could only say that the growth of the, the culture and the dynamic of everything, best people to ask are probably the players uh, on the change they, they saw in one year. Right. And I, I guess that's difficult to sell the systematic uh, foundational changes that are really essential to having any term uh, uh, any kind of long-term success when really people now when they consume news are like well who did they sign I, I mean how do you balance that that mark like staying true to the process versus the immediate punch saying hey we've arrived yeah it's uh, what me Axel and the ownership believe and what we do every day so it's so important when you're growing a club and you're in the process that you respect the passion of fans and everyone, but you can't read too much into it because then it takes the focus away from what you want to do. And we, us more than anybody else, we want to give to the fans what they deserve. And we think we're in that direction. Today, uh, we have players like Inbom. 22, Ranko, 21, Ouso, 22, Kimiri, 21. These are all guys that are playing. They're on the field. They're going to be on the field and they're, they're playing. We have a young team, like you said in the beginning, but guys that were playing, Ouso was playing in Israel. Ranko was the captain of his team in Serbia. Inbom was playing and he was wanted when we got him uh, in South Korea. So I think we're doing moves that today... They're, the thing is that they're not the moves of we're announcing Ibrahimovic or we're announcing a, a name like that. And some fans would like that, but we, we want to stay real to what we want to be about. Well, I, I think that fans are starting to see the direction you want to go. You struggled in your first match, but then you bounced back with a statement win over the LA Galaxy. Your team is young. They do have some experience. They're athletic. They're fierce. The mentality seems like it's right. Is there a certain play, type of player that you want to kind of, ref, you know, the, the club to go after to reflect what you want to see in the team? And, and maybe that player might have a little bit more experience to help some of these young players along. So let, let's give an example to a player that we signed. We signed Lucas Cavallini, right? Uh, 26 years old, a player that has experience from his time in Mexico with the national team in Uruguay. And everybody, when they look at a forward, they just look at goals, goals, and stats, and numbers. Uh, and we look a little bit more than that. We look at how they set the tone for the team. And his work ethic without the ball is incredible. 
and the way it works for the team is just fantastic. And we want our players to, to be contagious with one each other. And we want our team to look at each other on the field and say, man, the way this guy's working next to me, I have to work even more and becomes an effect of intensity in the team. And this is just an example or a guy that we, we went and get that maybe people don't see as a, a big name and see a player that has, uh, doesn't have the impact of an Altidor, let's say in Toronto. But if you look at a guy like Toss Ricketts, what he brings is honesty on the field every day and his commitment. Even when Toronto won MLS Cup, the, the, the minutes he had to participate looks like always he brought something to help. It's a big goals, yeah. Yeah, and now you see that with his work ethic, with Lucas, he scores the goal that gives the winner in LA. I, I hate speaking about individuals and names, but I just want to give you examples of guys that are contagious and, and have a positive effect in groups. Can I ask you about one of your, your other players? Because it relates to the Canadian men's national team. A, a lot of people believe that Maxime Cropot will be Canada's number one in the not-so-distant future. I mean, what, did, what impressed you about him last year? And how did he grow as a player through that experience? Well, when we were rebuilding the team, uh, we wanted to try to get the best goalkeeper possible that wasn't a foreigner. Uh, and there was, I, I followed an example of Tim Melia, uh, that is today the keeper of Sporting Kansas City. When I look at how he became the goalkeeper he is today and going through Charleston Battery in the USL and becoming a pool goalkeeper. And sometimes goalkeepers, it's like coaches. They just need to be given the opportunity. And I watched a lot of Maxim Cripple with the Ottawa Fury in the USL. And I think he was by far the best goalkeeper in the USL. And when we were rebuilding, there was no doubt for us that this keeper just needs an opportunity. And we wanted to give him that opportunity. And we brought Zach McMath in. In the beginning, we felt maybe Zach, by his experience of Colorado and Philadelphia Union, he would have the, the pole position. Uh, but then it became very clear in preseason that Max was meaning business. Max saw that as his big shot to, to confirm that he belongs in MLS. And then I think that last season, he just confirmed. In a year that we struggled, in a year that was difficult, he was probably our most consistent player. Um, and I, I'm not the, the national team coach. I, I can't talk about who's going to be next, but I could say that I, I, I believe that Max has a huge chance of becoming the number one one day. Absolutely. Uh, he, he, was, he was special at times. He's going to be a big part of your team whenever this new season begins, and we hope hopefully that sooner rather than later. Just a couple more for you here, Mark. You've been really gracious with your time. This has been great stuff. Um, obviously, you have Canadians littered through your, te your team. Derek Cornelius, Grew by leaps and bounds last year as well. But his partner at center back, Daniil Henry, went overseas. And I was just thinking back to, to what you said about players getting out of their comfort zone, going somewhere else to have that experience, to grow as a player. Does moving to Asia, South Korea, I mean, does that kind of fit the bill? Is that because essentially that's kind of what you did, taking yourself out of your comfort zone. Maybe that will, that will help the player grow leaps and bounds. Well, number one, Daniil already showed that when he went to, to, to England, right? It's not that it's a big uncomfortable place going to the Premier League, but Daniil had already experienced that. And then he came back to the league and uh, he showed that even the year before I arrived, going to the Ottawa Fury, playing some games, I think Daniil is persistent and he has that type of mentality. Uh, for him, South Korea was a, a big opportunity also, uh, not only in as a player, but also financially, right? So for him, it was big opportunity. But what you touched here was players getting out of comfort. Uh, Derek, when we went and signed Derek, Derek was in the second division of Serbia. It's not easy. It's not easy. It, it rains all the time. It's cold. Uh, it's uncomfortable. The second division is hard. And I think 
the players that are willing to, to go out of their comfort zone, to go pay a price, to go really, that's called chasing your dream. These are the players that are the best equipped in the future to succeed. And maybe they won't have an incredible playing career, but they'll, have, they'll form connections that could help them for maybe assistant coaching position, coaching position, so many other things and getting out of your comfort zone uh, gives you an uh, 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 equips you for with also a lot of great connections uh, just two more for you you mark uh, obviously there's a lot of pride within vancouver within the whitecaps club about what's going on with alfonso davies just signed a, a new contract with bayern munich a lot of people have contributed to his growth and you're missing some good stuff by not having social media now him on tiktok legendary the stuff that he's putting out there I'll, I'll, maybe your kids can show you at uh, at some point mark but I, I i mean the way that he has come on did you see this happening so quickly in a massive club uh, like bayern munich on a massive stage in the bundesliga and champions league so the first thing what uh, what, what i'm gonna say is maybe i'm not gonna have a lot of friends in the u.s but I, I really think that the two best north american players today are canadians i think uh Jonathan and Alfonso are, are very special today. Um, Alfonso for sure is the best player in North America right now. Um, and he's not only playing in Bayern Munich, but he's an important piece. And he's probably a player with uh, the profile that could go even to, to a bigger club. Uh, not saying that Bayern is really big. Bayern is part of the big ones. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up in a Real Madrid or... Manchester or, United. As a supporter of Manchester United. Yeah, after. Like, honestly, <laughs> zero surprise. Uh, am I surprised? I'm, I can't say surprised, but to see him have such an impact today in a club like Bayern Munich, after a year of being there, a year and a half, it's remarkable. But I remember the first game he played against Soul Park Rangers. I was very impressed. That was my first encounter with Afonso on the field. 15 years old and the way he, he, that first game, he tore us apart. And that game actually helped us uh, win the conference final against uh, Vancouver that year uh, because we were, we were in our guards big time. And, that game, I was very impressed. I thought, what is this guy doing in the USL? Incredible. Um, you and Whitecaps as a club and their fans have a lot to be optimistic about. Do you put timelines on an, uh, in terms of how you want to um, accomplish things in, in terms of, you know, whether it's player development, point totals, and obviously things have been kind of thrown out of whack with what we're dealing with right now in COVID-19, but how do you kind of legislate and how do you organize your vision and how you want to execute it moving forward? Right now, myself and Axel, the, the, the thing we want to show fans is that at the end of the season, whenever, whenever the season is going to start and, and end, we want the, the, the fans to say, man, this was a huge improvement from, from last year. Uh, you could see the team going in the right direction. You could see young players having minutes, growing, playing, results showing. Uh, and that's that's our objective for this year. To say we want to make the playoffs, we want to we want to win the Canadian Championship. Everybody says that. Uh, so I think that if we continue doing the things that we're planning to do and keep on growing. Because that, that game against Kansas City for us was an off one because our preseason was really good. Our tournament in Portland was really good. And the proof that we felt it was an off one is the way we bounced in L.A. right away. So we just want to keep growing as a club and show our fans that we're committed to it. Mark, let's end on this note. Uh, this has been phenomenal. Um, there has been some questions that came in, but I think that this is kind of a good way to wrap things up because you've been there, done that. You've seen football in this country and abroad on all levels. Shamar wants to know what advice you would give to young players looking to make it in the game today in this country. What advice would you give them? Well, Shamar, I would say apart from the technical ability and you having to work physically and technically and and, uh, and being careful with your nutrition and how you improve as a player. 
I would tell you that you have to stay strong in the, the tough moments. You know, the players and the coaches that make difference are the ones that they continue grinding and working and pushing when things are difficult. And too many young players, they break as soon as they see a little bit of uh, adversity. Very good. Uh, on that note, this has been an incredible hour, Mark. Hopefully this kind of pulled back the curtain a little bit and shared your story because it's one of success. Uh, it's one that should be inspirational to young coaches, young people wanting to get into the soccer industry. And I wish you and the Vancouver Whitecaps nothing but success going forward. It's going to be a ton of fun seeing these young players under your leadership come together and try to build something really special on the West Coast. I love the passionate fans in Vancouver, and they're looking forward to it as well. Thank you so much for doing this tonight. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you for having me. Thank you very Head much. coach of the Vancouver Whitecaps, Mark DeSantos. We're going to be back next week with more guests coming your way, perhaps even a bonus episode coming your way on Monday night. Stay tuned for that. Follow us at One Soccer. Subscribe on our YouTube channel at One Soccer as well. Coming up next, a uh, viewing party It's going to be Valor and York 9 from this past Canadian Premier League season. I want to thank Mark. I want to thank the Vancouver Whitecaps, Armin, and my producer, David, as well. On behalf of everyone here at One Soccer, I am Gareth Wheeler. Stay home and stay safe.